Today I'd like to talk to you about uh, equilibrium reactions and some of the uh, concepts that go along with them. Equilibrium reactions are reactions essentially that will uh, always have both products and reactants present in them. And the reason for this is that, that when you have this reaction, A plus B giving C plus D, you have a in the middle you have arrows pointing in both directions, half arrows. This is an indication that there's an equilibrium in existence here. The x, y, z, and p are the coefficients uh, that balance the equation. How this works is that A combines with B to form C plus D. After a certain quantity of C and D are formed, C and D combine to reform the A plus B. So in the system, you will always have a certain amount of each of these present. These processes can cause uh, some interesting things for chemists who want to have reactions to, to go to high yield. Equilibrium reactions can be challenging, but at the same time, there's things we can do that will improve these. One of the things that when you're working with equilibrium reactions that you need is to have what is called an equilibrium constant. And the equilibrium constant is represented as KEQ. KEQ is going to be defined as the quantity of products divided by the quantity of reactants. And we're going to raise these quantities to the power that is equal to the subscript in the balanced equation. So for instance, in this case, we would say that that KEQ would be C raised to the Z power times D raised to the P power divided by A raised to the X power times B to the Y power. This would be your equilibrium expression. If you had values for the concentration of, of A, B, C, and D, we could calculate what this constant would be. The KEQ essentially will tell us which side of the process is favored. If KEQ is large, that means that products are favored. There's more of this than there is that. If KEQ is, is small, that means that your reactants are favored. The reason being is that there's a small amount of this present. Most of this is present in the process. So, Large KEQ means product, small means reactants. The reaction of nitrogen and, ammonia, and hydrogen to form ammonia is one that you see a lot. And a lot of times when it's written, people don't write it correctly. The reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen to form ammonia is called the Haber process. And it is a process that is an equilibrium reaction, or the reaction is an equilibrium. The problem with that is that Originally, when this reaction was proposed and done, there were low yields of ammonia, the NH3. But Fritz Haber was able to design a process where considerable amounts of ammonia could be produced from this reaction. And frankly, it, he won a Nobel Prize for it because it revolutionized the idea of, of fertilizers and planting foods and things of that type. In other words, feeding the world. But when we look, look at this, the KEQ expression for this would be ammonia, the concentration of ammonia squared, divided by 
the concentration of nitrogen times the concentration of hydrogen cubed. All right. It's easy to solve for KEQ once you have your expression. All you do is substitute numbers. Over here on the left hand side I've given you some numbers that we can use. Nitrogen is one mole. Hydrogen would be two moles. Ammonia is one mole. And we put this into the equation. And when we do that we remember to square and cube the numbers that we need to square and cube. And when we calculate that, we get a value of 0.125. Now, these numbers that I've given you were simply examples. They would not reflect what you can actually get from this process. But given that, given the values that we have, I would ask you this question. With a 0.125, would product be favored or would reactant be favored? Of course, the answer is that, pro that reactants are favored because this is a small number. When we talk about small and large numbers, large numbers are 100,000 and bigger numbers than that. Small numbers are anything that's one or less. At one or less, essentially, you're not making much progress toward a product. So you want those numbers to be as large as they can be. But that's how you would do that. That's how you would do that. Now, how can, was this process made efficient? How did the Haber process be, become something that could be used? Well, uh, it has to do with Le Chatelier's principle, and I'm sure I didn't say that correctly, but that's Le Chatelier. It's written here. You can see it. Uh, and his principle says that when there is a stress exerted on a system at equilibrium, <clears throat> the system will shift in such a way as to relieve the stress. All right. Now, this has implications as far as endothermic, exothermic reactions. It has implications on adding and subtracting reactants. It has implications in terms of change in pressure. In this example of an equilibrium, you see that we have A plus B in equilibrium with C and heat. And believe it or not, in this instance, heat is a product of the reaction. Now, Le Chatelier's principle says that if a shift, that if a stress is applied, that the system will move in a direction to uh, relieve the stress. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this. Heat is a product. What happens if we remove heat from the process? In that instance, there'll be more A and B converted to C plus heat. So in that instance, if you wanted to produce a lot of C, all you would need to do would be to cool the reaction down and make the equilibrium shift this direction ask yourself this question. What would happen if instead of removing heat, you added heat? You raised the temperature of the reaction, either accidentally or on purpose. What would happen? You're adding product. So in that instance, you're going to shift toward reactants. So you would decrease the yield of your product if you added heat. That's because heat is a product. If we had
this occurring, heat plus A being in equilibrium with B, what would the result of adding and taking away heat be? We ask ourselves this question. What happens? Is heat a product or is it a reactant? In this instance, it is a reactant. So adding heat essentially will shift the reaction toward product. In an endothermic reaction, which is what this is, adding heat should shift in the direction of your product, so it would help you form more B. Conversely, if you cool the reaction down, it's going to shift it toward reactants, and you're not doing that. Okay. Let's take heat out of our equation for just a moment. And let's ask ourselves this. What if we had a process where we were having a simple equilibrium between, between A and B? What would happen if we removed B from the reaction? In that instance, the reaction would shift to form more B. How else could you form more B? You would form more B by also adding other quantities of A. What if we had What if we had this equation? This is an equilibrium, and all of these are gases. All of these are gases. How would pressure affect the reaction if we have gases? Here's something to think about. On the, the left-hand side of the equation, we have seven molecules of gas. On the right-hand side, we have two molecules of gas. Increase in pressure will favor the side which has the least molecules of gas because that will be the least pressure. So if you increase the pressure on this system, you will form more product. If you decrease the pressure on this system, you will form more reactant. There are many ways that we can use Le Chatelier's principle and the principle of equilibrium in chemistry, and I hope that I've been able to explain some of these concepts to you so that you can better understand it. Thank you.